right. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us with this new episode of the Martinez Law Legal Lounge. Um, this is going to be just a very casual weekly chat. We do them every single Monday at 12 o'clock. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to bring your real estate questions or for us to chat about all things real estate. So I have some questions that were actually sent to me um, beforehand. So I will go ahead and address those today. But as you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if you also want to go ahead and say hello in the comments um, so that I know you're here, I would love to acknowledge you. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and introduce myself very quickly. My name is Kristen Martinez. I am the founder of Martinez Law. We opened up back in 2015 and we are a real estate law firm. We are unlike any law firm in the Tampa Bay area in that all we focus on is real estate law. We don't do any other type of law. We don't do divorces. We don't handle personal injury. Um, we don't even do title work. All we do is focus on um, real estate law and legal issues in the real estate community. Um, that's what we've done from day one. That's what we will continue to do. And we are here to be your resource for all things real estate law related. I want to go ahead and give you a quick overview of our firm and our current team. Um, obviously, myself, I am the founding attorney. I have a partner. Her name is Tiffany Love. She is also an attorney. Um, expertise is in real estate law um, with a special focus on condominium and association law. We have a paralegal on staff full-time. We have a full-time legal assistant. We have our chief operating officer, and we have two interns over the summer. Um, one is an undergraduate. undergraduate. Um, one is in law school, and she will be graduating next year, so we look forward to that. But that is our team right now. We are looking to add another full-time paralegal, so if you or anyone you know um, might be interested in that position, please let us know. Um, I like to say that we're always hiring. So if you know of anybody who would um, be a great fit for our law firm, no matter what capacity capacity that is, excuse me, I would love to chat with them and um, see if they would fit with our team. So um, with that, I will give a couple of firm announcements and then we'll go ahead and get started with some questions and answers. Um, first of all, last week I did announce this, but I will go ahead and let you know in case you were not um, part of the chat last week, but we have just launched flat fee billing for all of our litigation matters. So we were um, doing everything by the billable hour model, which is how traditional law firms charge, um, but we're not a traditional law firm. We are very high tech. We are um, keeping up with all of the latest trends and the latest things to make sure that our clients are taken care of. And so we are offering flat fee billing. What does that mean for you? That means that when you come to our office with a case, um, no matter what type of case it is, we will be able to quote you a flat fee and guarantee that fee, um, that that is the fee for your case. So there's no more, well, it's $300 an hour. So if it takes me two hours, it's this much, but it might take me 20 hours. Who really knows? There's none of that. We will quote you a flat fee. That is the guaranteed fee for your case. Um, and that will enable you to make an informed decision about whether you even want to move forward with the case or not, um, now that you know what it's going to cost you. So that is the big announcement that we launched last week. Wanted to give you a quick reminder on that. We are also now um, accommodating in-person new client consultations as well as client meetings. So I'm very excited. I just got out of an in-person um, client meeting this morning. Very excited about this. I'm ready to see you all face-to-face -face again. We are, of course, still accommodating telephone and Zoom consultations, but we are here in person as well, um, and that started last week. Finally, I just want to give you a quick reminder about our Get Real with Attorney Martinez Legal Roundtable. Those are on the first Wednesday of every month at 1030. So the next one will be next Wednesday, which is June 2nd at 1030. If you want to go ahead and go ahead and comment some of your questions, I do have some questions um, 
that were sent to me between last week's chat and this week, so I will address those. But one thing I did wanted to go ahead and address was the CDC eviction moratorium. Um, a lot of our workload handle uh, deals with evictions, and so a lot of questions that I get are about the eviction moratorium and what does that mean for my case? Um, can I even evict? What does that mean for my tenant? So I wanna go ahead and address that because I think that there are a lot of um, misconceptions or even just misinformation that is being put out there regarding the moratorium. So right now the moratorium is in place through June 30th. So we are looking at at least another month and some change. Um, whether that will be extended, I don't know. Um, the One of the purposes or the main purpose of the eviction moratorium is not to help out those tenants who are in financial hardship. That is what everybody assumes um, the primary goal is, and that is certainly a goal. But the biggest goal of the eviction moratorium is to stop the spread of coronavirus. And so now that we have a vaccine and that vaccine is um, readily available to most of the population, I would tend to think that this moratorium would be coming to an end soon, if not next month. Um, but I don't know. You know, it, it, your guess is as good as mine on that one. But I do want to touch on the substance of the moratorium and where it applies. So. The moratorium only applies to evictions for non-payment of rent. Um, there are many, many, many reasons why a tenant may be evicted. There are many ways that a tenant can violate their lease other than simply not paying their rent. They can um, have an uncured HOA violation. They can have an unauthorized pet in the property. They can damage the property to an extent that would warrant terminating the lease and evicting them. Um, their lease could have expired and they didn't sign a new lease and they didn't leave. That would be a basis for eviction. None of those types of evictions are affected by the moratorium. The only types of evictions um, that cannot be completed at this time is evictions for non-payment of rent. Within that category, there are even more restrictions on the types of tenants that the moratorium applies to. <clears throat> so the moratorium only applies to evictions for non-payment of rent. Within that category, it only applies to tenants who can show of coronavirus, whether that be they lost their job, they suffered a reduction in wages, they have very high medical bills due to a coronavirus-related medical issue. Um, those would all be examples of financial hardship as a result of coronavirus. <clears throat> in addition, they would also have to show that if they were evicted, they would more than likely become homeless. Um, the language for this requirement is a little bit ambiguous. Um, what does more than likely become homeless mean? Um, but they would have to show that they have no other place to go, they can't afford to get another place, and they would either become homeless or they would have to move into a group-like setting. Um, and this goes back to trying to stop the spread of coronavirus. We don't want um, folks unnecessarily in group homes if they can help it. They also would have to show that they have applied for um, government assistance with their rent payments. So they have to show the financial hardship that's preventing them from being able to make their rent payments. They also have to show that they have applied for government assistance with this and have been denied. Um, finally, they have to show that they have made partial rent payments or as much of their rent payment as they can afford to make. Um, this does not apply to most tenants. Most tenants are um, who are facing eviction are likely not paying any rent at all. So unless the tenant can show all of these things, the eviction moratorium does not apply to them and they can be evicted um, pursuant to law as would normally be the case without um, consideration of this pandemic. So. I wanted to put that out there because I think that the assumption is that all evictions are on hold right now. That's not the case. Um, even for evictions that do fall under this moratorium, the eviction can still be filed. The entire process can be completed except for the final step, which is actually service of the writ of possession. Um, so we can file the eviction lawsuit. We can prove that um, the eviction is warranted. 
we can get a final judgment for eviction, the only thing we cannot do until this moratorium is lifted is have the sheriff go out and serve the writ of possession, which is the vehicle they use to actually remove the tenants from the property. So if you are in that situation, if you have rentals um, where you have tenants who aren't paying or who otherwise aren't complying with their lease or who don't have a lease, um, there are things that you can do to either evict now or to set things up so that when the eviction moratorium is lifted that you are set up properly to go ahead and complete that process. So if you have specific questions about that, you can leave them in the comments here. You can also reach out to me directly or call our office. Um, we would love to talk you through that and help you out if we can. One of the questions that I received um, last week we got a direct message to our Instagram um, from an agent that we've worked with in the past, um, and she was dealing with an escrow dispute. And her question was basically this, the contract fell apart, um, parties didn't make it to closing, and both buyer and seller were claiming that they were entitled to the escrow deposit. Her question was, and she represented the seller in this, um, in this particular case, her question was, if my seller signs the release and cancellation, does that prohibit them from pursuing any other sort of legal remedies if they chose to do so? The answer is yes. So under the contract, there are several different types of remedies available to buyer and seller in the event that the contract is breached, in the event that um, the contract never makes it to closing. One of those remedies is called specific performance. And what specific performance is, is instead of asking a court or a judge to award you money, you are asking the judge to force the other party to go forward with the closing and to either sell or purchase the home. So we're asking the court in this situation to force certain conduct versus asking a judge to award us a certain dollar amount. Specific performance is a remedy that um, is exclusive to real estate. And the reason for that is because real property, real estate is seen as something very unique. You cannot replace it um, with an exact replica. You cannot replace it with money necessarily. Um, it would be very difficult, especially in this market, to be able to find the exact same property in the exact same location with the exact same square footage and upgrades and details um, if you were to lose out on a contract. And the law recognizes that. So you have the option of asking a court to award you money so you can go out and try to purchase a similar property. But the law recognizes that you will not be able to find the exact same property in the exact same location. And so this remedy of specific performance is the legal world's attempt to make that party whole in the event of a failed transaction. And so if this type of remedy is something that either the seller or buyer is considering, they should not sign the release and cancellation. Even if they don't care about the deposit and they're okay with the other party having that deposit, whether that be buyer or seller, they should not sign the release and cancellation because they are potentially waiving any further course of action or remedy that they may have um, in relation to that contract. Now, if their intent is to waive any future remedy and they don't want to move forward with anything, um, they want to be done with it, they don't want the possibility of either party filing a lawsuit, then yes, both parties can sign the release and cancellation and be done. But if either party wants to preserve their opportunity to do that, um, my advice would be not to sign that, um, that release and cancellation. All right, so that takes care of the question that we got sent um, by Instagram after the last um, the last live session. If you have any questions, I would love to hear them in the chat. If you do not, do not feel comfortable publicizing them in the chat, um, you can always um, send me a direct email. You can always call our office. I will take this opportunity now to mention as well um, that anybody in the real estate profession, so that's going to be real estate agents, real estate investors, title companies, lenders, 
If any of you have legal questions for me, I offer all of you a free 15 minute consultation. Um, so at any time, if you have questions about anything, assuming I can answer it, um, please reach out to me by email, please call our office. Um, I would much rather educate you, answer your question properly, and have you take a more informed course of action, then you or your client be calling me down the road um, with a mess to clean up. That, that's not why you want to be calling my office. So um, again, free 15-minute consultation to all real estate agents, title companies, um, investors, lenders, anybody in the real estate profession, um, please utilize that. I have many agents that utilize it, and I think we have avoided some situations that could have resulted in a dispute because of that. So please, please, please contact me with those questions. Um, we do have a question in the comments here, so I'll go ahead and read that out. Um, he says, I've been seeing more buyers purchasing Airbnbs. One of past buyers currently has a person refusing to leave. Do the, does the Airbnb renter have tenant rights? Um, the answer to this question is no. So there is a separate section of the Florida statutes that govern short-term rentals. Um, so that's going to be hotels, Airbnbs would also fall into that, um, that category. So the good news for the Airbnb owner is they do not have to go through a formal eviction process. There is a much more streamlined legal process that they can go to go through um, to get those residents out. Um, they do not have any tenants' rights. They are not obviously um, protected by the eviction moratorium. So that is something that they can move forward on. They can move forward on right away, and it is a, a much more straightforward, condensed um, process than eviction might be. Great question. Thank you for your um, participation. Hopefully that answered your question um, for Airbnbs. The particular part of the statute is um, they term it transient rentals. Um, so that's going to be, like I said, hotels and Airbnbs and other sort of sort of short-term rentals, usually less than 30 days at a time is the requirement for that. Um, if you have an Airbnb and you're renting it out for six months at a time, um, the answer may be different, but I am assuming with this question, we're talking about shorter term than, than 30 days. All right, Charmaine, thank you for your um, your comments in the chat. Thank you for attending. Andre, thank you for the awesome question and for attending as well. Um, I will leave it open for any more questions if you guys have them. Um, I will go ahead and share here as well. Next Monday is Memorial Day, so I will not be um, we will not be hosting a legal lounge next Monday, we'll, but we will pick right back up again the following Monday at 12 o'clock for the Martinez Law Legal Lounge. Um, if you wouldn't mind as well taking a moment to go ahead and like this video and share it. Um, we also will be reposting these videos on our YouTube channel um, so that if you've missed it or you want to go back and um, look up a certain topic, we will be time stamping these with the different topics and reposting them to our YouTube video. Or our YouTube channel, excuse me, so that those will be avail available for you. All right, and I will do one last call for questions. I am not seeing any. Um, again, thank you all for attending. Um, I will see you two weeks from now. I hope you all have a great and productive week. I hope you all have an awesome Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully you get to take some time off and get some rest and relaxation in there. I know I will be. Um, again, thank you, and I will see you in two weeks.